Hey, good morning, Trinity Dallas. My name is Matthew Rowland. I'm one of the campus pastors here. We are one church in multiple locations, and that includes our location online. So thank you for joining with us today. As you may have already heard, we are a community of God seekers. We can't seek God without a community. We're called to do this together. And so we thank you for your participation online. God has called us to knit together, to draw together, to walk together, do life together as we grow and we seek Him first. After all, that's what we're called to do as people and as a community. Seek first the kingdom of God. And we thank you for seeking Him first with us today. Now, we've got a very special message in store for you. And because I know you're going to benefit from it, we're going to benefit from it. We also know there's many other people that might not have the opportunity or be even aware that they could join us online. So could you do us a favor, just take a moment and share this video with them. Like the video as well. We wanna make sure everybody who possibly can is able to join with us and watch the message with us today. You're a part of our community. We're so glad to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for being a part of this church family. God bless you. Well, good morning, Trinity people. It's great to see all of you visiting, gathering, talking, having a great time. Thank you so much for joining us here for services. Uh, my name is Derek Wilson. I serve on the pastoral team here at the church. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to welcome those of you who are online. We have many, many people watching online, really around the country, watching Trinity. Uh, people are on vacation. They tune in. They check out what's happening here. So welcome to all of those of you who are watching online. We're starting a new series this morning called Discipleship. Um, I'm going to be teaching the opening session, and then Pastor Joe is going to close us out with two messages on discipleship. And as you know, discipleship is a core value for us here at Trinity Church. So we're going to be talking about that. The subtitle is this, Following the Teaching and the Teacher. Following the Teaching and the Teacher. When I was a little boy growing up in West Texas, I have two brothers, an older and a younger. I'm the middle. That's why I'm in counseling. And uh, we caused a lot of problems in the neighborhood. We got into a whole lot of trouble. We broke windows. We burned people's backyards. We, we did. We, uh, we did all kinds of very mischievous, bad things. But in the sixth grade, I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. I converted to Christianity from being something that was really bad I converted, and I became a Christian. And they said that in the neighborhood. They <laughs> praised God. People in the neighborhood who weren't even Christians came and congratulated my parents. They said, we're considering salvation now. We're considering it. So there was a big difference. There was a big difference, really. There was a change. I converted. Uh, I, I became a Christian in the seventh grade. I was water baptized. I came to an understanding of what that meant to be water baptized. I obeyed Christ, became water baptized. But I wasn't discipled. I wasn't discipled until my late 20s. When I was serving in my first ministry position, and there was uh, our associate pastor, his name was Sam O'Toole. He was in his 70s. I was in my 20s. And he saw that I had not been discipled yet. And so he decided that he was going to disciple me, started meeting with me. He said, Derek, meet me at the Petro uh, restaurant on I-30 at 5 o'clock in the morning every Tuesdays, and I'll disciple you. Now, I'm not a morning person, but I started meeting with Sam at 5 o'clock every Tuesday, and the discipleship process began. And it made a significant difference in my life. Um, I want to take a look at a definition of discipleship. You'll see this on the screen. A disciple is to learn. That's really what the, the word means. It means to learn. A disciple is a learner, one who follows both the teaching and the teacher. Now, when I was converted, there's a difference between a convert and a disciple. When I was converted, there was an initial attitude change within me. Um, and I understood what it meant to be a sinner. I repented of my sins, and I, by faith, began to follow Jesus in a life of worship. That was conversion. It's the beginning of the Christian life. So we might describe that as being born again. I was born again, and I began the Christian journey. But when Sam started discipling me, that was a different thing. 
Discipleship is when a person who believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior positions his or her life to learn and grow and mature and develop. So if a convert is born again, a disciple is growing and maturing. If a convert is at the beginning of the Christian journey, a disciple is in the Christian journey, walking the path with Jesus. So there is a difference. Here's the way Jesus says it in Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Notice that Jesus didn't say, go and make converts. That's not what Jesus said. He said, go and make disciples. So this morning as we start this this series, I want to talk about what's the process of becoming a disciple. What's that process look like? What are the stories that we can learn from in the scriptures that describe that? So what does it mean to become a disciple? Now, In our day and age, when we think about learning about something or growing in something, we may think about a lecture hall. We may think about a classroom. We may think about bullet points or a list or a chart. But in Jesus' day, when they thought about discipleship, they would have never thought in those terms. Jesus never took his disciples into a lecture hall. Jesus never laid out a PowerPoint with bullet points for his disciples. Jesus made disciples by walking with them. They walked with Jesus everywhere he went. Jesus never traveled more than 2.5 miles an hour. Never in his entire life did he ever go faster than a walk. That's the speed of discipleship. Everywhere Jesus went, people walked with him, and the whole time he was walking, he was teaching, he was training. He was discipling people. Just like Sam O'Toole meeting with me at 5 o'clock in the morning at that restaurant, and he was discipling me and teaching me. And when Sam met with me, he taught me three big things. The first thing is he taught me how to have a quiet time. Now, I'd been in church for quite a long time, and no one had ever taught me how to have a quiet time, how to meditate on the Scriptures, how to have a prayer life, how to worship Jesus, and actually make a difference in my life. And Sam taught me that. The next thing he taught me is how to manage my money. I'd been, again, a Christian for a long time, and no one, and I had great parents. My parents were really good, and my dad was really good with money, but no one had ever set me down and taught me how a Christian man manages resources. Sam taught me that, and Russell Ann and I still live by those same principles today. I still have a quiet time the same way Sam O'Toole taught me all those years ago. And then lastly, and most importantly, Sam taught me how to speak to my wife. He, I remember one day he confronted me and said, Derek, you know, I was watching you, and the way that you talk to Russ Lamb is not good. So I'm going to change you. So he discipled me. He taught me how a Christian man treats his wife, how to respect his wife. He taught me that my Christianity is expressed in the way that I love my wife. Very convicting, very challenging. And then, of course, what I found out is a process of that. Russ Lamb was always asking me to go meet with Sam. (laughs) She told him, hey, could we do more than once a week with you and Derek, maybe? Could that happen? And so it radically changed my life. I believed in Jesus. I had a relationship with Jesus. I was water baptized. But the way I managed my money... And the way I treated those who were important and the way that I spent time with God had not yet been discipled. But that relationship happened. So let's take a look at how Jesus did this. So I want to take a look at a few stories from the scriptures and watch how people became discipled under Jesus. The first one is Jesus calls his disciples. This is in Matthew 4, 19 through 20. And here's uh, what happens. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting nets into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. 
at once they dropped their nets and followed him. Now, this is an amazing story, and we know from the Gospel of John, this was not the first encounter that these men had with Jesus. If, if it was, it would seem kind of strange that Jesus would walk up to them and say, hey, drop everything and follow me, and they would do it. That, prob- that may have happened, but we do know that Jesus had some interaction with them before this meeting. But here's the important thing. They physically left the life they were in to follow Jesus. They left the life they were in to become disciples. They left what they knew to follow what he knew. They left what they knew about the world, the way they viewed the world, their worldview, to be discipled in the way that God views the world, in the way that God sees of the people, in the way that God views life. And so the application here is this. Disciples follow Jesus. Disciples make a decision that, yes, they've been converted, they have a relationship with Christ, but they make a decision that they're going to follow Jesus. Let's take a look at the second story. He began to teach them. So he's called his disciples, and they're now following him. And now in this story, we're going to see how Jesus begins to teach them. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Now when Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on the mountainside. He sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And this is the Sermon on the Mount. And for three chapters, Jesus goes on through chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. Now, that's only in the Scriptures. They didn't have chapters when he was speaking. But if you have a red-letter Bible, all of those chapters are read because Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's teaching them. And this is a very significant moment because Jesus is is teaching them in a very different way than they've ever been taught before. He's changing their direction. They're moving from outward observance of the law to inward obedience of God's Word. Moving from an outward observance of the law to an inward heart change that the Word of God has upon them. It's a big move. It's a big change. It's it's this. It's anger versus murder. In the Old Testament, we know that murder is a sin. In the New Testament, according to Jesus, even if I get angry to the point of murder, then I'm sinning. It's lust versus adultery. In the Old Testament, I had to actually commit adultery to have the sin. But Jesus says, if you think upon someone else with lust, then you're committing adultery. It's covenant versus divorce. It's honesty versus oath. It's mercy versus vengeance. What Jesus is doing is he's discipling the people around him. He's changing who they are on the inside. They're becoming more like Jesus on the inside, which changes the way they act on the outside. Francis Schaeffer is a great historian, philosopher, theologian. He says this about this passage. People are unique in their inner life and inner thought world. The way they are in their inner thought world determines how they act. The way you and I are on our inner thought world determines the way we we act. This is why Jesus gave us the Beatitudes. This is who we're supposed to be on the inside because as we acquire the Beatitudes, it changes everything about the way we do on the outside. And so Jesus was teaching his disciples, and they began to follow him. Here's the application. Disciples are becoming more like Jesus on the inside. If you and I are becoming more like Jesus on the inside, it will change everything about us on the outside. But if we try to change who we are on the outside without changing to be like Jesus on the inside, it's really one failure after another, isn't it? We have a very difficult time modifying our behavior. But when Jesus changes on the inside, things begin to begin to change. Let's look at the third story. He leads them into a storm. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. He leads them into a storm. And I want to uh, take a look at, the, uh, at Luke and how he sets up this same story in his gospel with the opening sentence. Luke says this, 
let's go over to the other side of the lake. So Jesus, they're on one, Jesus' disciples are on one side of the Lake of Galilee, and Jesus says, let's go over to the other side. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was asleep. The disciples went and woke him and said, Lord, save us. We are going to drown. Now, Jesus said, we're going over to the other side. And the disciples said, God, we need to counsel you a little bit. I'm not really sure if you're fully aware of how creation works, but we're going down. Jesus said, we're going over. The disciples said, no, 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 God, no, that's not right. We're going down in this storm. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? He got up and he rebuked the winds and the wave that completely calmed down. The men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Even the wind and the waves obey Jesus. We struggle to. We're, we're uh, the people that Jesus died for. We struggle to obey, but the wind and the waves obey. Jesus called his disciples into a crisis of belief. He put them in a dangerous moment on purpose. He knew the moment they got into that boat that the storm was coming. And he knew the storm would be violent and the storm could take him down. And these disciples, they knew this lake like the back of their hand. They'd been in many storms. They knew the difference between a storm that was just kind of nice and provided rain and a storm that was life-threatening that could take them down. And this was that storm. And Jesus purposely put his disciples in the storm. When I was a little boy, I was 11 years old in 1976. I was at summer camp. And the most eerie, haunting song came out on the radio that summer that's always stuck with me about a shipwreck. And it was called The Shipwreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. How many of you remember that song by Gordon Lightfoot? Okay, people raising their hands that are old like me. Um, <laughs> That song just haunted me as a kid. I just remember hearing that song, and, I, just, and I was not afraid of the water. I grew up in a, in a swimming family, and, uh, but I was learning about boating that summer at summer camp. I was learning how to sail. I was learning how to canoe, how to kayak, all boats. I was learning about boats and actually doing it, and this song came out, and it kind of rattled me. On November the 10th of 1975, the Edmunds Fitzgerald, which was the largest ship in the fleet of American boats that sailed the Great Lakes, went down in a storm so fast that there were no witnesses. All 29 people on board died. And the, the ship evidently, the, the storm called 75 mile an hour winds with 30 foot waves. And evidently, we don't know for sure, but people theorize that the ship went up on one of the waves and because it was carrying 30 tons of iron ore, when it came down on the backside, it nosedived and went straight to the bottom of the lake, 550 feet down in a matter of seconds. It hit the bottom so hard that the ship broke apart. And it was kind of devastating for the country. People, in fact, today, people still meet once a year at a church in Detroit to, to remember and commemorate this accident and the 30 other thousand people that have died on the Great Lakes in storms. Um, there can be very violent storms that happen. Sometimes Jesus calls us to get into a boat, and that boat is on a surface that could kill us. That boat crosses surfaces that may cause real insecurities in all of us. But Jesus says this, we're going to the other side. Here's the application. Disciples get into the boat with Jesus. When Jesus calls you to step out in the area of your life, when he calls you to deal with maybe a painful moment, an insecurity, um, a, a new challenge in business, a, new, a, a challenge to improve your relationship with someone that it's very difficult for you to improve that relationship with. When he calls you to get into the boat with him, disciples get in. Disciples get into that boat. 
Our next story is in Matthew chapter 9. This is the problem. We've looked at uh, the storm that Jesus led them into, but now Jesus is going to tell his disciples what the problem with the world is. He's going to identify the problem in the world. It's the same problem that we see today. But Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 10, 1 says this. Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every diseased and sick person. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Now watch this. Because they were harassed, they were helpless, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he called his disciples to him and said this, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers into the field. And then he closes with this. Jesus called his disciples to them. He gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and every sickness. So Jesus identifies the problem. He looks out at the people of the world and he sees that they're harassed. They're helpless to do anything about that harassment. They have no power to do anything about it. And they're leaderless. And what's Jesus' answer to that situation? Jesus takes authority over all of those problems and he, t- he sets those people free. And then he turns to his disciples, knowing that there's going to be a day when Jesus is not walking the earth physically anymore. And Jesus turns to his disciples and gives them the exact same authority. So that wherever God finds in the world people are helpless, he sends a disciple. Wherever he finds that people are leaderless, he sends a disciple. Wherever people are being harassed, Jesus wants to send a disciple. Here's the application. Disciples are God's answer to where harassment, helplessness, and and lack of leadership is plaguing people. Wherever that's happening, maybe at your school, there is a situation where injustice is happening. The answer is a disciple. Maybe at your workplace, maybe there's... um, a, uh, at your workplace, there is something illegal that's taking place. The answer is a disciple. Maybe there's a group of people that you're connected to that are leaderless. They have, there's no leader. There's no one stepping up the plate. No one's making a decision. The answer is a disciple. We see in Jesus' life, whenever he saw people that harassed, whenever he saw people where injustice was happening, and they didn't have really... The the Bible says he had compassion. It so moved him that not only did he do something about it, but then he equipped other people to come after him that were going to deal with the problems on the earth today. And that's really where we are today. In short, let me say it like this. A disciple is learning what Jesus does and then doing what Jesus does. Learning what Jesus does and then doing what Jesus does. We might say it like this. Discipleship is becoming like Jesus on the inside so that I can act like him on the outside. It's submitting to that process of meeting with Sam O'Toole at 5 o'clock in the morning and allowing him to challenge me about my personal life. Allowing him to challenge me about the way that I am a father and I'm a husband, allowing him to challenge me about the way that I manage resources, allowing him to challenge me and show me about how to deepen my personal walk with Jesus. That's what discipleship is, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. Well, here's the the challenge that I want to ask about you today. I want to give you a chance to respond just as Jesus did with his disciples. Remember, it's not just the teaching, but it's also following the teacher. So here's my question to you. I have two. First, are you a convert or are you a disciple? 
Are you a convert? And remember, there was a time in my life where I was, I was a convert. I accepted Christ as a sixth grader, and the neighborhood rejoiced. I was a convert. And then I was water baptized as a seventh grader because I followed Christ in obedience. But I was discipled in my late 20s in an early morning relationship with a wonderful gem of a man of God who spent time with me and challenged me. Are you a convert or are you a disciple? And if you're a convert but you would like to be a disciple, you're in the right church. Because from the day this church was planted, Pastor Joe and Nancy have always had a vision and a passion for seeing that people are discipled. The people that would, that would like to have that same relationship that I had, that that can happen in this house. And we can pray with you about that today. Number two, many of you are trying to make a decision about this. Will you get into the boat? Jesus is calling you to make some changes in your life. And you know it. You know that he's calling you to step out and do something new. Or he's calling you to bring healing to a broken relationship. And, and it's dangerous waters. It's scary waters. It's a dangerous place. Disciples get into that boat because they know that Jesus is in that boat with them. And if Jesus is in that boat with you, no matter what he's calling you to do, you're going to make it to the other side. And when you get to the other side, you will, be, have, you will have grown and matured and developed as a Christian and then the next opportunity, the next boat that you have to get into, you'll jump into it with Jesus. And you'll keep going over. And you'll keep going over. And you'll keep going over. So some of you this morning, maybe that's the life that you want to enter into. And we're going to give you that opportunity. Would you stand to your feet with me? And as you're standing, I want to ask our ministry team to go ahead and come forward. Our ministry team is going to be here. Uh, folks that are ready to train, to pray with you, talk with you. And again, here's, a, here's the point of response that I want to ask you to respond to today. First, are you a convert or a disciple? And you know today, you know what, Derek, I'm a convert, just like you were. I'm, I'm a convert, but I want to be a disciple. Come and pray with some folks here. We can help with that. We can start that process with you. We can help with that. And then secondly, some of you are disciples, but there's a boat that Jesus is telling you to get into. And you've been resisting. And it is scary. It's a little bit like that Gordon Lightfoot song. It's, a, it's scary. But I want to encourage you today. Come forward, grab someone's hand, and pray with someone. Because Jesus, if he's calling you, he's already in the boat. And you're going to get to the other side. He will get you there. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you're doing at Trinity Church. I thank you that 30 years ago, you established this church to be a, dis a place of discipleship, a place where not only people could be converted, come to Christ, but a place where discipleship happens, a place where life change happens. And so, Father, I'm praying for every person who's making a decision today, every person who's responding to your word, that, God, you would meet them there Get into the boat with them. And Lord, bring them to the other side. Lord, it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our first message in discipleship. I hope to see all of you next week. And if you've made a decision, please come forward. We'd love to pray with you.